Dr. Perlmutter is a board-certified neurologist and six times New York Times bestselling author. His books have been published in 32 languages and include the bestseller, Grain Brain. His newly published book, Drop Acid, focuses on the pivotal role of uric acid in metabolic diseases. He is recognized internationally as a leader in the field of nutritional influences in neurological disorders. And with that, let me start the interview. You're a board-certified neurologist and six times New York Times best-selling author. So welcome to Modern Health Span. It's a pleasure to have you on our channel today. I, I'm delighted to uh, be on with you. And again, uh, as we talked about off-camera, I'm grateful that you were able to uh, accommodate the incredible uh, change in our time zones. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, it's great to have you on. So Dr. Palmada, so you recently recently published a new book, so Drop Acid, all about the dangers of uric acid. And I've just finished reading it, and it certainly alerted me to the importance of uric acid for our health. I think that, you know, most people, it's for them, it's not a measure that they look at with, with great detail. And so I think, you know, the book really helps with that and provides, uh, you know, a clear understanding of kind of the, the science as well as an explanation of what we can do to kind of optimize the level. So what I'd like to start with is just some background on uric acid and kind of where does it fit into our metabolism? Sure. And that's exactly how I structured the book. I wanted people to understand what this is all about. And then as you saw towards the end, okay, now that you get that, now that you have a firm understanding of the science, which really is not that difficult. Now the next question becomes, gee whiz, uh, if my uric acid is elevated, how in the world am I going to fix it? And that's actually very straightforward. So what is uric acid? We've all learned about it over the years in the context of something called gout. You have very high uric acid, it precipitates in the blood and can form crystals in your, in your toes that can be hurt, that can really cause a lot of pain. We've known about that for an awful long time. What we haven't known is that uric acid is a very powerful signal in your body, alerting you, alerting your physiology basically that winter is coming, that there's going to come a time when you're not going to have food or your food resources may be very compromised. And therefore it's telling your body right now, make fat, store fat, lower your metabolism so you can conserve energy, raise your blood pressure so that you can have blood supply to your organs uh, and even raise your blood sugar so that you can power your brain. Uh, this is new and very exciting information in the context of our ancestors, all of the things I just mentioned were good things. Having higher blood sugar, blood pressure, uh, making body fat, those were all powerful survival mechanisms during times of food scarcity. Now, we are still turning on all of those mechanisms 365 days a year for the winter that basically never comes. And when I say winter, I'm talking about not having anything to eat or any, any water to drink. So where is it coming from? And uric acid, making it very simple for us, thank goodness, only comes from three things in your body. Uh, a chemical breakdown of the DNA and RNA in the foods that you eat, that's called purines. The conversion of alcohol into uric acid when you drink alcohol. And certainly the biggest uh, threat to elevated uric acid in our modern times, and that is the sugar fructose. Fructose is you know, an incredibly powerful signal to our bodies telling us eat the ripened fruit in the late summer, early fall, because winter's coming. A very, you know, a very uh, long standing signal to us, getting us ready to survive. Now we are targeting that fructose consumption into uric acid. Again, as I mentioned, 365 days a year, it is this fructose that allowed us to know when the winter was coming and prepared us so we're exquisitely sensitive to fructose elevation in our bodies when we consume it and the the signal is screamed in our bodies by that player that uric acid that's the the mechanism by which our body is alerted stress is coming we may not have food we may, we may not have water make a lot of fat and, you know, in our ancestors, even our Paleolithic ancestors, and certainly before that in our primate ancestors, we all have had elevated uric acid. 
we have a uric acid in humans that's four to five times higher than other various other mammals uh, because of some mutations that we have in our genome in in an enzyme that would otherwise have broken down the uric acid called uricase we have we don't have uricase so uric acid in you and me and every other human on the planet tends to accumulate and tends to signal us to prepare for caloric scarcity and you know once we get that then we have now a powerful new tool in our toolbox because all of the things that I've talked about are metabolic disturbances. And that's important because this disturbance in our blood sugar, in our blood pressure, in our body fat, uh, these metabolic, what I call metabolic mayhem, uh, these are central players as they relate to what the World Health Organization characterizes as the number one cause of death in humans on the planet. That is the chronic degenerative conditions, the uh, Alzheimer's, type 2 diabetes, coronary artery disease, some forms of cancer. These are metabolic issues uh, at their core. And that's what's killing people today, Richard, as you and I have this conversation, far more than any virus. And yet uh, this pandemic isn't recognized so much by world leaders you know, here in the United States we actively support the growth of corn that is used to some degree to make this high fructose corn syrup that then plays upon the system and is going to bankrupt our healthcare delivery uh, because of our lack of concern for this pandemic far beyond covid that's what people are dying of so you talked about a lot of these uh, metabolic things uh does Uric acid also impact the brain. Actually, you mentioned Alzheimer's as one of the conditions that it kind of impacts. Well, anything that's going to um, change how we handle blood sugar, glucose, affect insulin, uh, increase inflammation, and increase the production of what are called, uh, uh, or increase what we call oxidative stress or the damaging effects of chemicals called free radicals, and elevation of uric acid does all of those things will clearly impact the brain. And one a study that was recently published out of Japan followed a group of 1600 people, it's in the book, uh, for 12 years. And at the beginning of the study, they did one simple thing. These were non-demented people, adults. They measured, of all things, their uric acid. Why would they have done this study 12 years ago? Well, they, they've been dialed into the uric acid message for a long time, knowing that, yes, it increases inflammation, it increases oxidative stress, it threatens to elevate blood sugar, all of which are bad for the brain. These researchers said, hey, let's see what happens to these people. And what they found was that in that group uh, of uh, over 1,000 individuals, 1,600 individuals, those with the highest level of uric acid had an 80% increased risk of becoming demented, a 55% increased risk of actually developing Alzheimer's disease and a 166% increased risk of what is called vascular dementia, not enough blood going to the brain. So for me as a neurologist, this becomes really very, very important because it is something we can do on the front end. Uh, you know, it's not when the patient's now coming to your office saying, hey, I can't remember my grandchildren's names. Uh, the Wi-Fi code, whatever it may be, you know, at that point, we're already well down the continuum of brain decline. We want to keep people healthy on the front end and be really preventive as it relates to cognitive brain function. Can I ask, so why has it not come up before? I mean, th this, this study was 12 years ago, uh, but, you know, you, you've just written the book now and kind of alerting people to this. Well, the study actually came out in 2018, so not, oh, not that oh, long. Right. It was a 12 year study. Oh, um, yes. But uh, old habits die hard. And one idea that was really deeply inculcated to our brains was in the medical profession that uric acid deals with gout. End of story. Here's the medicine doctor that you should be using. And that's really an open and shut case. So it's, it's oftentimes very hard to take things out of their pigeonhole and begin to realize that other things may be going on. You know, for a long time, we didn't even consider the role of testosterone, for example, in women, because, oh, that's a male hormone. Well, it turns out to be 
very important in women. We didn't consider, uh, for example, the idea that uh, a, a hormone that affects the contraction of the gallbladder could have an effect on the gut and on the brain and on the, the entire rest of the body. So it takes us a while to really um, reassess uh, you know, a lot of the stuff that is deeply ingrained in our brains. The, a, a book was published in 1898 by a doctor named Alexander Haig that looked at the wide ranging implications of elevated uric acid well beyond gout looking at high blood pressure, looking at dementia, looking at depression. And the, the real uh, lion's share of research began actually about 20 years ago, which really isn't that uh, too distant in the past. But now there are researchers around the world that are making this very clear. And there are certain countries like Japan and Turkey, for example, and now slowly the United States that are beginning to realize two, two important things. Number one, that you know, our metabolic dysfunction is the biggest issue threatening our health on the planet. That's for sure. Uh, you know, life, uh, length of life here in America is declining. Average lifespan is declining in men and women pre-COVID, I might add, because we are just in such a in dis, disarray as it relates to our metabolism. So people are beginning to take notice and now have recognized that this uric acid is really playing a very important role. Is it the end all? Absolutely not. There are other things that are important. We know that exercise, of course, getting enough sleep. But interestingly, we can look at those uh, issues and others through the lens of uric acid, and it all tends to come together. So it is a very, very important a new tool in our toolbox. And yes, I've been lecturing to to med you know physicians and colleagues uh, around the, around the world, and you know doing this interview with you right now, for example. But I will say that uh, one thing I've learned is to gain a lot of traction, it's often best to go directly to the consumer first and let them push the narrative. I mean, we did that in 2013 when I came out with a book that said, hey, eating a lot of sugar and, and gluten might not be the best thing for your brain. And, and you know, again, uh, you might have asked the very same question back then. Well, why aren't people talking about it? Well, they're sure talking about it now, you know, and here in America, uh, looking at blood sugar and diet are really important uh, things that mainstream medicine is talking about as it relates to the brain. And I think that uh, we're very much in the same place as it relates to uric acid. So all of your viewers and listeners on this podcast, you know, I wouldn't say they're riding the wave yet. They're still swimming out, paddling their boards out to catch that wave. It hasn't even, surf's not even up yet. 